Today we have a very special build plan. We're going to build a mini ITX system inside the all-new Dr. Zaber Sentry 2.0 case. Let's get started. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Today we are going to get all of these parts over here into the Zaber Sentry 2.0. It's a mini ITX case that's only about 7 liters in size. This is not my first mini ITX build, but I believe it's the first one that I've done here on this channel. Before we get into it, I do have a couple of people I want to thank for sending over parts for this build. For starters, Gigabyte sent over their H370N Wi-Fi mini ITX board, so huge shout out to them. Noctua sent over their NHL9i, which is, which is a mini ITX 37mm high cooler, which should be a perfect match for this build here. Inwin also sent over their brand new CS700 watt SFX power supply that they debuted over at CES. And viewer Jeremiah sent over a 1070 Founders Edition card. So huge shout out to Jeremiah. You rock, man. Also going in the build is a 512 gigabyte ADATA M.2 SATA SSD, which I did purchase myself over on Amazon. Uh, we've also got the Patriot Viper 3200 megahertz RGB memory. CPU choice for today's build is an Intel i5-8400. It's a six-core, six-threaded CPU. I did go a little bit more conservative than the gamery route on this, mainly because we're aiming for 1440p gaming, and honestly, the 1070 is going to be more than enough to handle that, and there should be no CPU bottleneck whatsoever. Now that you know what's going in it, let's get started. Don't be fooled by the fact that I'm filming the conclusion for the Zaber Sentry 2.0 build on the next day. Everything inside of here went off without a hitch. This is a very compact machine, but there is still a place for everything inside of it. 
but there's also an order of operations that you need to strictly adhere to when building this machine. Make sure you follow the instructions in the manual precisely or you will make a mistake. Even something as mundane as saying, well, I'm already here, I might as well screw this part in, will make it impossible to complete another step down the road. I did fall into this trap and we'll get to that in just a minute. Now, I know that might be a little bit frustrating to some, having to build a machine out of order that you're used to, but that's exactly why the Sentry 2.0 is able to fit all of the hardware into such a compact little box. Before we go over the build process itself, let's talk about the two orientations you can use this case in once the build is complete. There are four rubber feet included, which allow you to use the machine laying down in a desktop mode, laying flat on a desk, or nuzzling up next to an Xbox or PlayStation in your living room AV cabinet. These install by popping the feet in and securing them with a plastic peg. The whole thing functions kind of like a drywall anchor, ensuring the feet won't just fall out, but still allowing them to be removed if needed. The other way is to use this included stand and mount it vertically, which is how I plan on running the system full time. This saves the most space on your desk and gives you a footprint that is only about four and a half inches wide by 13 inches deep. In other words, this i5 desktop with a 1070 reference card takes up about the same amount of space as a wireless mechanical keyboard would, and that's pretty crazy. Now there is a difference in performance in these two orientations. In desktop mode, the bottom of the case is only about five to six millimeters above the surface of the desk, meaning there's not a ton of airflow going to the GPU or optionally your 120 millimeter AIO radiator. This resulted in an 82 degree GPU temp in heaven benchmark and averaged about 1620 megahertz on the core clock over five minutes. This is technically still an overclock and is not thermal throttling as the base clock on the 1070 Founders Edition is 1506 megahertz. But contrast that with setting the Sentry upright and the clocks jump all the way to 1750 megahertz. Acoustically, both configurations were pretty even and in both orientations, the i5-8400 averaged around 47 degrees Celsius, which in my mind is perfect given the size constraints of this case. As far as the assembly goes, as I said, there was a place for everything and everything fit exactly in its place. I have no real complaints about the build process, more just some comments on things that I would like to do differently if I were to build this system again. First, while the power cables from the Inwin SFX power supply all routed in very logical paths, this is certainly a build that could have benefited from a custom length set of sleeved cabling and would have resulted in a much cleaner look in the end. While everything fit and the case closed without me having to sit on top of it, there was still a bit of slop that I would rather not have seen in the end result. The 24 pin power cable isn't very flexible and was actually too long, making it difficult to access other headers on that side of the motherboard. The SATA connections are completely blocked and the USB 3.0 front panel connection was very difficult to install and getting the power button and LED plugged in required me to actually use a set of needle nose pliers to get the headers connected. I also had some difficulty with the 8-pin EPS connector. While that run was slightly easier to make, the fact that it had two 8-pin connectors on the end of it made it difficult to hide the extra set. And it's the same story with the GPU power cable as well, let alone the fact that that cable was about twice as long as I needed it to be. As I do plan on keeping this system together long term, I might be making an order of some 100% custom length cables just to tidy this thing up a little bit. Depending on what you'd like to use your Sentry system for, there are a number of use case build guides in the manual to help you design your PC to meet those needs. I've opted for the living room gaming PC design, which is a 65 watt TDP CPU and an air cooler and a full length blower style graphics card. But that is far from the only option. As I mentioned, the Zapier supports up to a full length graphics card paired with a 47 millimeter high air cooler on your CPU or an ITX size graphics card with up to a 120 millimeter AIO cooler on your CPU. But all that said, I'm honestly very happy with the performance of the Noctua NH-L9i. 47 degrees under gaming load and the fan is just above a whisper the entire time. Even the GPU isn't screaming under full load. For a living room gaming machine, it's actually pretty friendly when it comes to noise. As far as the rest of the build process goes, I don't have any real complaints about fitment or quality. The Sentry 2.0 is amazingly sturdy and everything went together easy as you please, so long as you follow the directions in order. I did install the power cable extension to the rear of the case too early and had to remove it to screw in the motherboard. I also missed a critical step entirely when I saw the finish line was close at hand. There are two PCB risers inside of here for the PCIe slot that allow the GPU to sit horizontally to the motherboard. Plugging these in was simple enough, but I missed a bracket that holds the second riser card in place. That not only made it difficult to install the graphics card, it's potentially damaging to the riser cards or the motherboard PCIe slot. So follow the directions in order and you'll be just fine. And you won't have Zaber DM you on Twitter and let you know that you may have screwed up. Allegedly. The Dr. Zaber Sentry 2.0 will be available at the end of March with an expected retail price of around 230 euros or roughly 260 US dollars and includes all of the accessories and options I showed off here. It is a premium ITX case and comes with a premium set of expectations in my review. And I'm happy to report it met all of them handily. 
If you want to build in one of the most compact gaming machines possible at just 7 liters in volume, the Century 2.0 is certainly the right choice to make. That's going to do it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And let me know, what would you put inside of the Dr. Zaber Sentry 2.0 if you had one? Let me know down in the comments below. Be sure to like this video if you liked it or dislike it if you didn't like it. And subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. If you're interested in picking up the Dr. Zaber Sentry 2.0 for yourself, I will have links down in the video description, as well as Amazon affiliate links for all of the rest of the parts that I used in this build. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing, and if you'd like to chat with me, make sure to look me up on Patreon, where a $1 donation gets you access to my exclusive Discord server. Again, thank you all so much for watching this one, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Perfect timing. Beer number two. We've got Two Town Cider House Serious Scrump. Now, this isn't just some ordinary cider. This is an 11% unfiltered imperial cider. Uh, reading from the side, it says, Rich and substantial, Serious Scrump is a dry, scrumpy cider made using an ice juice process. An eclectic blend of apples are pressed, frozen, and slowly thawed, resulting in a thick, aromatic juice, which is then fermented with traditional English cider yeast. So, this should be a pretty heavy hitter. Uh, more in the mouthfeel of like a champagne than a tra traditional apple cider. You know when you pour something and you can smell the ABV? Yeah. Whew. Oh, that smells good. Wow. <laughs> that is good. Oh, that is seriously good. It's uh, much, much sweeter than the uh, description led on. Uh, that is like a thick, really, really pleasing apple cider that still kind of plays with your tongue. And it's definitely boozy. It, it is not, uh, this is not a drink that'll sneak up on you. You can taste the booze on this, but it is all blended just so well. Oh, it's so good. I take it back. That's a dangerous drink. You can taste the booze, but you don't care.